Welcome back to the Hardware Unboxed News Corner. It's been a little while since we've run one of these episodes on the channel, but I'm back in the hot seat to recap all the week's big hardware news stories. A few interesting ones to get through today with Computex and E3 not going ahead this year. There's been a pretty slow filter out of the news from what would normally be all collated into a week at those shows, but... Yeah, it's actually been kind of strange not having to prepare and go to Taiwan for Computex this year, but hopefully we will be back next year. So to start this one off, I just wanted to quickly recap the news about AMD's Ryzen 3000 XT processors before moving into other stuff. We did talk about this in our B550 motherboard analysis video when the NDA expired a few days ago, but in case you didn't watch that video, let's talk briefly about the new Ryzen CPUs. Also, Go watch that B550 video. Steve did a great job looking at a few of the boards and talking about why they are priced where they're priced. So the 3000 XT lineup is pretty simple. We have the Ryzen 5 3600 XT, Ryzen 7 3800 XT, and the Ryzen 9 3900 XT, which are all very similar to their non-XT parts. The Ryzen 9 CPU keeps its 12-core layout, but bumps up the boost clock by 100 megahertz from 4.6 to 4.7 gigahertz. The Ryzen 7 3800 XT remains at eight cores and gets a 200 megahertz boost clock improvement. And for the 3600 XT, still six cores. We're seeing just 100 megahertz again on the boost clock going from 4.4 to 4.5 gigahertz. Base clocks, cache configuration, and TDPs all remain identical. So this is a fairly minor improvement to the existing Zen 2 lineup. There was a bit of hype surrounding these parts pre-launch with talks of increased base clocks and other improvements, but it doesn't seem like this is materialized. We'll have to wait and see where the binning has improved with the XT series in our reviews of the parts. But for now, it looks like a small clock speed bump and AMD are only touting up to a 4% performance improvement. Pricing for the parts matches the existing X-Series MSRP, so the 3600 XT comes in at $250, the 3800 XT at $400, and the 3900 XT at $500. However, given parts like the 3800X are selling for $330 right now, with the 3700X at $275 US as just one set of examples, the asking price for products like the 3800 XT seems a bit high. AMD are also no longer offering a box cooler with the 3800 XT and 3900 XT, which does hurt the value of those parts further. These CPUs will be available on July 7th, and you can expect to see reviews around that time as well. AMD's upcoming Zen 3 processors remain on track for release this year, according to a statement the company released this week. This was in response to a DigiTimes rumor from earlier in the week, suggesting AMD would delay Zen 3 CPUs into 2021. AMD has confirmed that this rumor is inaccurate, and that Zen 3 is still on track for 2020 as they've previously stated. However, while AMD has said that Zen 3 is coming at some point in 2020, so far there has been no clarification around what line of Zen 3 processors will launch this year. A lot of the focus has been on the desktop lineup, but AMD could very well be a little bit sneaky here and be referring to their Epic Milan processors, which are also expected soon, and will use the Zen 3 architecture. It's possible the desktop lineup is indeed delayed or coming in 2021 with Epic in 2020, or we could just be seeing both this year or just the desktop line. We just don't know at this point from AMD's pretty vague statements. And you could see why some people might think AMD will delay their Zen 3 desktop processors into next year. They're just about to launch the Ryzen 3000 XT series, which could be a stopgap between now and Zen 3 at some point in the future. But given the XT series are just minor clock speed bumps and seem more of an anniversary edition type release to mark one year of Zen 2, I don't think this has much bearing on the release plans for future AMD CPUs. AMD also confirmed through their latest corporate presentation that Zen 3 products would use one of TSMC's 7 nanometer nodes, refuting another dodgy DigiTimes rumor that claimed desktop Ryzen 4000 processors could actually be using 5 nanometer tech. Several slides show both the compute and data center roadmaps with Zen 3 being a 7 nanometer product, while Zen 4 moves to 5 nanometer. Seems pretty unlikely that AMD would be able to just change plans and make Zen 3 a 5 nanometer product to help out. TSMC or for other reasons, these parts are locked in a fair way in advance and that sort of node shift would take a significant amount of re-engineering. So there we have it, two rumors refuted, Zen 3 is still on track for 2020 in some form and will be using 7 nanometer technology. Intel has shown off a prototype laptop with an Intel Tiger Lake CPU and integrated XE graphics. On Twitter, the laptop was shown to be running Battlefield 5 using high settings at native 1080p with a frame rate around 30fps. 
Parts of the gameplay do dip below 30 FPS in the clip, despite Ryan Shrout, chief performance strategist at Intel, claiming it runs at or above 30 FPS, but it gets pretty close to 30 FPS most of the time. Now on face value, there's no way anyone would actually want to play Battlefield 5 at 30 FPS. The game even runs above that on consoles like the Xbox One. But given the game is set to using high settings, it's quite likely this Tiger Lake system could deliver a playable experience with lower tier settings, a mixture of maybe medium and low for example. And that's definitely quite impressive for a thin and light notebook. This indicates to me that it's one of the fastest integrated GPUs available in this sort of form factor. The question remains around the GPU configuration and the power target for this part. Tiger Lake is rumored to feature up to 96 XE execution units in its maximum integrated configuration, up from 64 with Ice Lake. But we don't know whether the power configuration here is 15 watts, 25 watts, or something higher. Given Ice Lake's integrated GPU benefits significantly from a 25 watt TDP up configuration, I suspect this laptop is also running on the higher side. There's also going to be competition from NVIDIA's low-power discrete GPUs. I know a lot of people talk about these parts being killed off by more powerful iGPUs, but they just keep hanging around. The MX250 does reasonably well up against Ice Lake, and now NVIDIA are offering more powerful parts like the MX350. How these parts compare to Tiger Lake and AMD's Zen 2 APUs will be something we'll have to explore when they launch later in the year. NVIDIA seems to be up to their usual refresh tricks once again, according to the latest leak, I guess you'd have to say, from Ida64. The popular reporting tool has added support for two new GeForce GTX 1650 GPU variants, increasing the total number of known GTX 1650 models up to four. The GTX 1650 isn't a particularly amazing GPU and wouldn't be one of Nvidia's big sellers, so it is a strange move, but let's look into what's going on here. So we know that the GTX 1650 is currently available in GDDR5 and GDDR6 variants, both with a 4GB frame buffer and TU117 GPU. The GDDR6 model is clocked slightly lower than the GDDR5 model on the GPU, just to keep everything within the 75W TDP. Now Ida64 are claiming there is also a TU116 variant of the 1650, as well as a TU106 model. As we know, TU116 is a step up from TU117 in the G416 series, going from a 200 square millimeter die to 284 square millimeters, boosting the core configuration from 1024 when fully unlocked up to 1536. Like other 16 series GPUs, there's no ray tracing or tensor cores here, but we do get the benefits of the Turing architecture. A GTX 1650 using this die would have to be cut down significantly, with just under 60% of the CUDA cores left active. The TU106 model is even crazier to think about. This would see the GPU used for the RTX 2060 and RTX 2070 repurposed for a $150 GPU with enormous amounts of the die lasered off. TU106 is a moderately large 445 square millimeter die with 2304 CUDA cores. It's also got tensor cores and RT cores. To use this for a GTX 1650 with just 896 CUDA cores would mean disabling the tensor and RT cores and disabling over 60% of the CUDA cores. And that's a pretty interesting use of dodgy TU106 silicon. Ida64 doesn't give any information about the core counts and clock speeds for these alleged models, so we don't know for sure whether they will be 896 CUDA core GPUs, but this would be expected. As for other configurations like clock speeds and memory, well, who knows? We'll have to wait and see what happens, but this definitely isn't the first time Nvidia has used multiple different GPUs for the same product. Just recently with the RTX 2060, we are seeing some cards using TU106 and others using TU104, both cut down to the same 1920 CUDA cores. Intel has launched their first PCIe 4.0 SSDs, an interesting move for the company given they are yet to launch a single CPU that supports PCIe 4.0. But using the latest PCIe spec in other areas of the business keeps them up to date with their competitors and it's something that we've seen from their other divisions like the one that makes network controls for example. As you might expect, these first PCIe 4.0 drives are destined for the data center and form the highest tier in Intel's SSD lineup outside of Optane. The SSD D7 series with catchy drive names like D7 P5500 and D7 P5600 use Intel's 96 layer 3D TLC NAND and feature capacities starting at 1.6 terabytes and ending at a huge 7.68 terabytes in a U2 2.5 inch form factor. The P5500 features higher capacities but lower random write performance and endurance, 
while it's the opposite for the P5600. Naturally, performance is quite impressive, at least going on Intel spec sheet. Sequential reads of 7GB per second and writes of 4.3GB per second is what you'd hope for from a PCI 4.0 drive, while Intel also lists 1 million random read IOPS. Not that you'll be able to buy one as a consumer given they're destined for enterprise applications where right now they'd need to be paired with an AMD Epic CPU to get the most out of them. Couple of gaming topics to round out this news corner. First we have Square Enix games returning to Nvidia's GeForce Now game streaming service. I found it pretty disappointing when a number of game developers decided to block access to games on GeForce Now, given the service effectively just allows you to rent a gaming PC in the cloud and play games you already own on it. But as publishers like to do, they got annoyed with the system, probably because they were unable to gouge more money out of gamers. Anyway, Square Enix has decided to bring their games back to GeForce Now after forming an agreement with NVIDIA. Supported titles include most of their popular stuff like Shadow of the Tomb Raider, Deus Ex Mankind Divided and the Just Cause games, but it's not everything from their library. Cyberpunk 2077 has been delayed again, this time to a launch date of November 19. The game was originally scheduled for release in April and then delayed to mid-September, but to add more polish to the game, CD Projekt Red has pushed it back another two months. Uh, this is set to bring the game closer in line with the launch for next-gen consoles, the Xbox Series X and PlayStation 5. It also, of course, allows them to yeah, improve the game, make sure that it's ready for launch and in a nice state. Some people believe that both NVIDIA and AMD were specifically attempting to get their next-gen GPUs out before their old release of Cyberpunk on September 17th. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see whether this changes either of their plans. I don't think it will, but we'll let that all play out down the track. That's it for this week's News Corner. As always, you can subscribe for our, yeah, I guess now you'd have to say infrequent episodes of News Corner and all sorts of roundups like that. Of course, you also get all of our other testing on the channel if you do decide to subscribe. We also have our Patreon page if you're interested. Links are in the description below. And I'll catch you in the next one. Bye.